Good morning, and welcome to the July 2022 Bastille Day meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. More importantly, it is the first meeting in our new building, in a room that is finally full of staff and members of the public, and it is terrific to see. I'm so glad you're all here today. Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda this morning? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you and good morning, commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear five items for your consideration. First, you will consider a report and order, and second, further notice of proposed rulemaking that would incentivize beneficial transactions for small carriers, tribal nations, and rural interests. Second, you will consider, consider a further notice of proposed rulemaking to modify the Commission's access stimulation rules to address ongoing harmful arbitrage of the Commission's intercarrier compensation regime that imposes costs ultimately borne by inter-exchange carriers and their customers. Third, you will consider a notice of inquiry seeking comment on ways in which the Commission can assist survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, dating violence, intimate partner violence, human trafficking, or stalking through the Commission's Lifeline and Affordable Connectivity Programs. The notice also seeks comment on how the Commission might protect survivors' communications records with support organizations. Fourth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would begin the process of updating the Commission's rules to use the most up-to-date market information for determining a television station's local market for carriage purposes. Fifth, you will consider an enforcement matter. Please note item five, an order and sixth notice of proposed rulemaking that would amend the commission's part 74 rules for low power television and television translators to remove obsolete rules for analog TV operations as listed on the commission's July 7th sunshine notice has been adopted by the commission and deleted from today's agenda. The first item on your agenda is titled Enhanced Competition Incentive Program for Wireless Radio Services and will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Joel Taubenblatt, Acting Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Taubenblatt, proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. It's great to see you. Today, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau presents for your consideration an item that builds upon Congress's goal in the Mobile Now Act to incentivize beneficial spectrum transactions for small carriers and for rural interests. I would like to thank the staff of the Wireless Bureau for their hard work on this item, as well as other bureaus and offices for their contributions. <laughs> Catherine Patsis Nevitt, an attorney in the Mobility Division of the Wireless Bureau, will present the item. Catherine. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Commissioners. The report and order and second further notice of proposed rulemaking presented for your consideration today would establish the Enhanced Competition Incentive Program, or ESIP, for qualifying transactions involving partition, disaggregation, full assignment, or leasing of wireless radio spectrum licenses. If adopted, the ESIP would facilitate competition-enhancing transactions, resulting in increased spectrum access for small carriers and tribal nations, and increased availability of advanced telecommunication services in rural areas. The program represents a productive step towards achieving long-standing commission goals and builds upon the congressional intent in the Mobile Now Act to further facilitate and incentivize transactions that will provide public interest benefits. The report and order would adopt two types of ESIP qualifying transactions, those that focus on small carriers and tribal nations gaining spectrum access in any location to increase competition, and those that involved any interested party that commits to operating in or providing service to rural areas. The small carrier or tribal nation transaction prong of ESIP would incentivize transactions that enable access to unused spectrum, furthering the underlying statutory goal of promoting spectrum availability for small carriers, while also expanding upon the congressional directive in the public interest to include tribal nations. To qualify for benefits under the small carrier or tribal nation transaction prong, any eligible covered geographic licensee 
must designate through a qualifying transaction a minimum of 50% of the licensed spectrum and at least 25% of the licensed area scaled down to 10% for larger licensed areas to either a small carrier or federally recognized tribal nation. The rule-focused transaction prong of ESIP would permit any entity committed to meeting the program requirements to participate, resulting in greater potential for increased spectrum usage and competition in rural areas. Qualifying transactions for the rule-focused transaction prong would include a minimum of 50% of the licensed spectrum and a minimum amount of qualifying geography that covers at least 300 contiguous square miles of rural area with appropriate upward scaling for larger licensed areas. To achieve the Commission's policy goal of promoting increased rural service, this prong establishes specific construction and operational requirements. The ESIP would offer three primary benefits. First, a five-year extension of the license terms for the assignee and assignor in partitioning and disaggregating transactions, for the lessor in qualifying spectrum leasing transactions, and for the assignee in full license assignments. Second, a one-year construction extension um, of the interim and final construction deadlines where applicable for all parties to a qualifying transaction. And third, a substitution of 100% of coverage of the ESIP qualifying geography in lieu of current construction requirements for assignees in rule-focused transactions. To ensure program integrity, the report and order would adopt the following waste, fraud, and abuse protections. First, a post-assignment holding period of five years commencing upon grant of the ESIP application, as well as a minimum five-year lease term. Second, an automatic termination of the relevant ESIP license for an e assignee's failure to comply with the five-year holding period, failure to meet the applicable that requirement, Third, a bar from future participation for any party to an ESIP qualifying transaction that fails to comply with the five-year holding period, prematurely terminates a lease arrangements, fails to meet the applicable build-out requirements, fails to meet the operational requirements required for the rural focus transaction prong, or enters into a bad faith transaction. Fourth, a, for rural focus transactions, an ongoing operational and service requirement for 100% of the qualifying geography for three consecutive years. The report and order would also require a five-year ESIP evaluation report that details the progress and effectiveness of the program. Independent of the ESIP, the report and order would reduce regulatory burdens and increase licensee flexi flexibility by permitting reaggregation of geographic licenses. Specifically, it would permit flexible use licenses to be reaggregated up to the maximum of the original market channel block size, provided that regulatory requirements have been fulfilled, including license renewal and performance requirements. The second further notice would seek comment on whether the Commission should expand the small carrier or tribal nation prong of ESIP to provide eligibility for non-common carriers offering service in non-rural areas. Finally, the second further notice would seek comment independent of ESIP on whether to adopt alternative construction requirements for wireless radio services with less flexible metrics, including a user share or use or offer to share safe harbor metric. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges to make technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear comments from the bench. We will start with Commissioner Carr. Uh, thank you to the Bureau team for all of your really hard work on this item. You know, I try to spend um, as little time in this job inside D.C. as possible. Uh, and so I go out a lot of times across the country and I, I was thinking back as we were, had this item and we were reviewing it about times I've spent in the Pine Ridge Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, which is along the southwest border of South Dakota. I thought about the times that I've, you know, driven all the way up to Maelstrom Air Force Base in northern Montana, and you're in these vast parts of the country where I look down on my phone and there's literally no bars. And in some circumstances it says no service on my phone, which is not something I'm used to seeing. And we're in these parts of the country where we know there's spectrum available, and we're in parts of the country where we know we have licensed this spectrum to a provider uh, to build out. And of course, our build-out obligations don't require people to reach 100% of the geography. When you're out there and you meet with smaller providers, 
many times, obviously, the, the business case is always going to be difficult in, in those circumstances, but they often just want a shot. You know, if we can get access to some of this spectrum, um, we're tied to this community, we're committed to this community, uh, we can accelerate the build out in these rural areas. And as we heard, uh, the Mobile Now Act um, encouraged us to <laughs> take this action. Um, there was an FC commissioner once that talked a lot about using carrots and not sticks. And I think this is an item that is chock full of carrots and hopefully it gets us there in terms of creating the incentive structure so that larger providers or any provider that has license spectrum that's relatively fallow they're not using, um, we can create the incentives for them to work with smaller rural tribal providers um, to put that spectrum to use in, in bridging the digital divide. So I'm happy to do this, happy to keep an eye on the incentive structures or more or less that we need to do as we go forward, but thanks to the Bureau for all your hard work on it. Thanks. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. There are no easy fixes to digital exclusion, but to be sure, creative policy making is an essential part of the solution. That's why I'm pleased to support this item, the Enhanced Com Competition Incentive Program, or ESIP, which attacks the problem by strengthening the spectrum marketplace in rural and tribal areas where the connectivity divide runs quite deep. We know that smaller marketplace participants are eager to put spectrum to use in tribal nations and across rural America. Shortly before we proposed ESIP, I met with the Red Cliff Tribal Nation, which couldn't attract competitive build out by a local licensee and wanted to build out its own wireless network, but couldn't find a way to access the spectrum. We need to make it easier for tribal nations like Red Cliff to access unused airwaves and for smaller carriers and other companies focused on rural deployment to do the same. And that's exactly what ESIP does. And that's why I'm excited about it. The program will extend license terms and construction deadlines for eligible participants, remove regulatory barriers that can discourage efficient win-win secondary market spectrum transactions. Rural focused entities also would benefit from substantive construction requirements that better fit their business plans. And every licensee would have the ability to re-aggregate spectrum on the back end which should make it easier for them to parcel off spectrum to smaller providers on the front end. These are all practical, common sense steps that can improve the functioning of the spectrum marketplace if they're not abused, of course. I welcome the specific, concrete, and tailored steps that we take in this item to prevent ESIP waste, fraud, and abuse going forward. Uh, of course, we need to keep a close eye on the program to make sure that if there are any unscrupulous actors, they don't exploit our rules and get a pass on build-out obligations in particular. Bad behavior in this program would not just make uh, a mockery of our rules and authority, it would also truly delay the introduction of new wireless services in those critical rural and tribal communities that will be left holding the bag. A program like ESIP has been a long time coming. I'm excited to see its impact uh, in these coming years. I'm glad to see us follow through, in particular, a proposal that I made uh, back in the earlier rulemaking stage to complete a comprehensive evaluation of the program after five years. As I've said before, of course, agency policy making cannot be a set it and forget it type of exercise. And I'm, I'm glad uh, we'll um, uh, you know, have the effort to review whether our policies are being effective, uh, actually achieving the objectives, uh, and learn from the experience and implementation to make this, this uh, successful program. Uh, I also welcome the further notices focus on not just improving ESIP, but also modernizing our service rules to account for private wireless deployments by all flexible use licensees. Private wireless technologies hold enormous potential. They can improve efficiency and consumer and worker experience in boundless ways and can have an extraordinary enabling uh, effect when it comes to reducing our carbon footprint. In fact, recent study estimates that 5G use cases could net us 20% of the total reduction needed for the United States to reach its 2030 emissions targets. And much of that reduction would stem from wireless deployments that enable smart agriculture, smart manufacturing, smart infrastructure, smart cities and other efficiency-driven applications. And so the economic and environmental promise here uh, is substantial. A and we need to make sure that these cases are deployed to the fullest extent possible. I'm glad my colleagues and the chairwoman uh, accepted some of my suggestions here to see comment on ways that we can ensure 
that every part of the country will demand, uh, with demand for private wireless, has the connectivity it needs to make these cases a reality. Private wireless won't always map perfectly to uh, population or to areas of concentrated enterprise demand. Uh, and so again, this is a competition issue and it's an environmental issue. So I look forward to reviewing a robust record, ways to solve this, and thank you to the Bureau for their hard work on an outstanding item. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I'm pleased to support today's Enhanced Competition Incentive Program order and further notice. Both the order and further notice build on the Mobile Now Act to encourage transactions for small carriers and tribal entities. The order which establishes the ESIT program includes three important benefits for providers, a five-year license term extension, a one-year extension of construction benchmarks, and a substitution of an assignee's coverage of the ESIT qualifying geography. These benefits, I think, will help providers to take essential steps to close our nation's digital divide. The second further notice of proposed rulemaking opens a dialogue on expanding ESIP eligibility and whether to adopt alternative construction requirements for wireless licensees in order to further build upon the program's objectives. I'm happy to say that because of the hard work of the Wireless Bureau staff, the FCC is taking significant steps toward a um, more inclusive digital environment that uh, I hope will benefit all Americans. Thank you, commissioners. No matter who you are or where you live, you need access to modern communications to have a fair shot at 21st century success. That is why the FCC is pursuing a 100% broadband policy. In other words, our efforts won't stop until we bring affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband to 100% of the United States. Now, to make this happen, we're going to need a mix of initiatives. That involves the tried and true, like the high-cost universal service program, as well as newer efforts like the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program and Affordable Connectivity Program. It's also going to require that we get creative, and that is especially true when it comes to infrastructure in rural areas. After all, the economics of deployment in rural areas can be tough. Networks are costly to maintain. They're difficult to build in places where population is sparse. Private investment can lead the way, but there are going to be places where it may not be enough. So we need to fix this so that rural communities are not forever consigned to the wrong side of the digital divide and shut off from the economic opportunities of the internet age. And today we adopt a creative policy to address this challenge. We establish a new program to help expand wireless service in rural areas and create more opportunities for wireless carriers and tribal nations. We call it the Enhanced Competition Incentive Program, or ESIP for short. And here's how it works. We know right now that there are some wireless providers that have access to airwaves that others might be in a better position to actually deploy. But in the past, our rules haven't always made it easy to get spectrum resources to those who want to build in the places that need it most. This new program will help fix that by building better incentives. Specifically, an existing wireless provider that uses its license to create new opportunities for smaller carriers or tribal nations by partitioning, disaggregating, or leasing the spectrum will see gain and not just loss for doing so. So how is that? From now on, we are going to reward them with longer license terms, an extension of build-out obligations, and more flexible construction requirements. It's a way to make sure spectrum in rural areas actually goes to those most likely to use it. But that's not all. We think we can do even more with this creative approach and evolve it over time. So today we seek comment on expanded eligibility for ESIP and how it can be used to help promote rural deployment applications like precision agriculture. I am very excited to see what new deployments this program is going to help foster. I'm also really grateful for the creative spark to establish this initiative that was first provided by Senator Klobuchar and Senator Fisher in the Mobile Now Act. We're making their incentive ideas from that legislation a reality today, and I think it's going to help expand wireless deployment in rural and tribal communities. It's a terrific tool to use, among others, to make sure we reach 100% of us with high-speed service. So thank you to the many staff who worked on this effort, including Lloyd Coward, Carrie Hicks, John Markham, Charles Mathias, Susan Mort, Catherine Nevitt, Roger Noel, Paul Powell, Jess Quinley, Jeremy Reynolds, Larry Summers, Sean Spivey, Joel Taubenblatt, and Mary Claire York from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. 
Pat Brogan, Jonathan Campbell, Judith Dempsey, Rachel Kazan, Cher Lee, Kate Matraves, Julia McHenry, Michelle Schaefer, Don Stockdale, and Emily Talaga from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Jeff G, Pam Kane, Jeremy Marcus, Salomon Satoshi, and Josh Zeldis from the Enforcement Bureau. Andrea Kearney, Doug Klein, Bill Richardson, Anjali Singh, and Jeff Steinberg from the Office of General Counsel. Barbara Espin and Sayuri Rajapaski from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, and Joy Ragsdale and Chana Wilkerson from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. And with that long list read, we are now going to proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item two on your agenda is titled Updating the Intercarrier Compensation Regime to Eliminate Access Arbitrage and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Trent Harkrader, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Mr. Harkrader, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today, the Wireline Competition Bureau presents for your consideration a further notice of proposed rulemaking that would, if adopted, seek comment on proposed rules to reduce the financial incentives for providers to engage in arbitrage schemes that exploit the intercarrier compensation system and raise the cost of service for long distance carriers and their customers. The item was developed by the Wireline Competition Bureau, but with extensive input from the Office of Economics and Analytics and our Office of General Counsel. I'm particularly grateful to the division uh, in WCB that was responsible for this, for keeping a keen eye on what was going on out in the ecosystem and coming to us with these ideas. I'm grateful for their dedication, and this item is a result of, of their work. With me at the table today are Gil Strobel, the division chief, Lynn Ingledow, the deputy division chief, and Ahoop of Adams, who is the attorney advisor responsible for this and who will present the item. Ahoop. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairman and Commissioners. It is such a pleasure for me to be here today in person. I joined the Commission during the pandemic, and what a special way to spend my first day in the office presenting an item at the Commission Open Meeting. This item follows the 2019 Access Arbitrage Order, in which the Commission adopted rules making access stimulating local exchange carriers, LEX, rather than inter-exchange carriers, IXCs, financially responsible for the tandem switching and tandem switched transport service access charges associated with the delivery of traffic from an IXC to an access stimulating LEC. Since the 2019 order, some providers have modified their businesses in an effort to evade the rules and continue harmful access arbitrage. In the further notice of proposed rulemaking before you, we propose ways to address these practices by updating the Commission's access stimulation rules. Specifically, the item proposes rules to address, address the problem of carriers inserting IP-enabled service providers, IPES providers, including VoIP providers, into call flows so that traffic no longer terminates to or through a lack. Some providers claim that when traffic terminates through an IPES provider rather than a lack, the access stimulation rules do not apply. Thus, IXCs and their end user customers continue to bear the costs imposed by access stimulation traffic. The proposed rules would require IPES providers to report their ratio of terminating to originating traffic. If an IPES provider's traffic ratios exceed the triggers established in the existing access stimulation rules, the IPES provider would be deemed to be engaged in access stimulation. In such cases, we propose that the intermediate access provider would be prohibited from imposing tariffed terminating trans tandem switching and transport access charges on IXCs sending traffic to the IPES provider or the IPES provider's end user customers. In the further notice, we seek comment on expanding the current definition of access stimulation to include traffic that traverses an IPES provider's network. The further notice would also seek comment on a proposed definition of IPES provider
for the purposes of the Commission's access stimulation rules. Finally, the further notice includes a proposal to clarify that for any access stimulating entity, traffic ratios apply not only to traffic delivered to an end office, but also to any equivalent of an end office. The Bureau recommends adoption of the further notice and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. There's a, a saying that we're going to try to coin now, which is, you know, where there's regulation, uh, there's arbitrage. And in this particular case, uh, when we're dealing with access stimulation, uh, this is arbitrage that costs the American ratepayers millions and millions of dollars. We took concrete action back in 2019, but with like a lot of arbitrage schemes, like with robocalls, it's oftentimes a game of whack-a-mole, uh, and we try to find where uh, these fraudsters go next. And I think with this order before us, we take another sort of concrete step based on the record of seeing how people responded to that 2019 decision uh, and look to close off some of those avenues, which again is just raising the costs uh, on people that are trying to pay, um, pay their bills. So really glad that we're taking this action, moving forward, and continuing to keep a very close eye uh, on an area of our regulations where it creates odd incentives for people to attempt to game the system. So thanks for all your work on it. That's my support. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. In 2011, the commission recognized that local exchange carriers undertaking access stimulation was harmful, and we took action. Ever since, the commission has been forced to play whack-a-mole. <laughs> I don't Sorry know about, if there's, about, a, there's a group Sorry think here. Yeah, I, I was going to go with cat and mouse, but I decided to go with whack-a-mole. <laughs> Commissioner Carr did as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to juice it up here, though. Bad actors <laughs> enter you into... You can try. You can try. <laughs> bad actors enter into access revenue sharing agreements and hit certain traffic ratio triggers. Whack! New arbitrage, <laughs> new, new, new arbitrage schemes created between, between 2011 and 2019. Another whack. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, <laughs> but this is no game. And today we take the next step in hitting bad actors seeking to take advantage of our rules to harm consumers and enrich themselves. So while I share the frustration that we must continually use scarce resources to modify our rules, due to harmful actions from a small group of carriers. I am heartened by the hard work of the Commission staff, the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau as well, and the changes that we propose in this item. It uh, will have my strong approval. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I just want to thank the staff for this work on this very thorough item. I look forward to supporting final rules, closing the loopholes used by companies to abuse the intercarrier compensation system and harm consumers. Whack-a-mole. <laughs> <laughs> so historically, our phone networks depended on a complex system of subsidies that kept prices low for consumers and helped ensure service in rural areas. It was really hard to understand. Um, in fact, what I would call it is Byzantine. So in the Telecommunications Act of 1996, Congress directed this agency to modernize it. And this required making implicit subsidies explicit, updating the compensation scheme for the exchange of network traffic, and developing the current universal service high cost program. Whoa, a lot of work went into this effort. But still, there are aspects of this system that would benefit from a further update. That's because we still have some companies that game the system by inflating traffic to grab revenues that were originally designed to support service in remote areas. This rulemaking is designed to shut down the loopholes that these companies are exploiting. That's because we want to make this system more simple, more fair, and more effective. So thank you to the staff responsible for this complicated rulemaking, including Pam Arluck, Susan Barr, Allison Baker, Ahuva Batams, Lynn Engeldow, Trent Harkrader, Heather Hendrickson, Albert Lewis, Jordan Roth, Zach Ross, Marvin Sachs, Michelle Slater, and Gil Strobel of the Wireline Competition Bureau, Stacey Jordan, Eugene Kisilev, Richard Kwiatkowski, Eric Ralph, and Shane Taylor of the Office of Economics and Analytics, Anthony De Laurentiis, Lisa Griffin, and Rosemary McEnery of the Enforcement Bureau, and Sarah Citrin, Jacob Lewis, Rick Mallon, Linda Oliver, Bill Richardson, William Scher, and Derek Yeo of the Office of General Counsel. We will now proceed to a vote on the item. 
Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item three on your agenda is titled Supporting Survivors of Domestic and Sexual Violence and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Once again, Trent Hargrader, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And again, Mr. Hargrader, so please proceed. Good morning again, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau presents for your consideration and notice of inquiry exploring ways that the FCC can use its tools available to improve access to voice and broadband service for survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, dating and intimate partner violence, human trafficking or stalking. I'd like to thank the Bureau team for their hard work on this item which represents a joint effort between two Bureau divisions, the Telecommunications Access Policy Division led by Jody Griffin and the Competition Policy Division led by Pam Arlick. I also want to thank our colleagues and the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of the Managing Director, the Office of the General Counsel, the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. As you can see, there was a lot of thought that went into this item. Joining me at the table today from the Bureau, from the Wireline Competition Bureau, is Diane Holland, Deputy Chief. Before we begin, I also want to acknowledge the contribution of Aureli Matthew from our Competition Policy Division. She worked very hard on this notice and was going to share the presentation duties today, but is unavailable to be here. Her colleague, John Lockwood, to my right, who is an attorney advisor in the Telecommunications Access Policy Division, will now present the item. Over to you, John. Thank you, Trent. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Thank you for having us here today. Every year, domestic violence affects more than 12 million people. For survivors escaping domestic violence, sexual violence, dating violence, intimate partner violence, human trafficking or stalking, reliable connectivity service can be life preserving. An independent phone or broadband connection can help survivors break away from abusive relationships while maintaining contact with safe support networks. In instances where survivors do not have access to an independent phone or broadband connection, it is important for them to be able to use other available services without fear of their communications, location, other, or other private information being revealed to an alleged abuser. This notice of inquiry, if adopted, would begin a process to evaluate ways in which the Commission can assist survivors in gaining independence from an abuser. The notice recognizes pending legislation by Congress to support this population, but further explores whether the Commission can independently support the needs of and protect survivors. It does so by seeking input into two main considerations. First, whether the Lifeline program and or the Affordable Connectivity program rules could better support survivors who face financial insecurity and other challenges as a result of violent or abusive circumstances. Second, whether and how the Commission can ensure survivor, survivors are able to communicate safely with abuse hotlines and shelters without fear of reprisal from an abuser. With respect to the Commission's affordability programs, the notice seeks comment on providing emergency communication support through either or both the Lifeline or Affordable Connectivity Program. Both of these programs are already available resources for low-income survivors, but our notice today seeks to learn how these programs might better support survivors. At the forefront of our consideration, the notice seeks input on how survivors may be required to show both their status as a survivor and financial hardship. The notice seeks input on how best to define these terms and how best to confirm an individual's status as a survivor facing financial hardship in light of the unique challenges survivors may face in obtaining documentation. The notice explores adjusting the affordability programs' application and enrollment processes to balance the ability of survivors to access income and identity verification documentation with the risk that obtaining such documentation may expose survivors to retaliation from their abuser. Specifically, the notice seeks input on whether income and identity documentation are readily available or difficult to obtain, as well as potential alternatives for confirming a survivor's income and identity. The notice also contemplates the role of shelters and assistance programs can play in qualifying survivors for an affordability program, as well as the potential for post hoc verification. Along with these questions, the notice seeks input on how to protect the personal information of survivors and alleged abusers 
while maintaining program integrity and guarding against waste, fraud, and abuse. Beyond this, the notice seeks input on the communication service needs of survivors, measures for determining the effectiveness of any changes the Commission makes to enrollment procedures, and whether the efforts discussed should be aimed more broadly to include other individuals who experience sudden financial hardship or who may have similar difficulties assessing eligibility documentation. A second aspect of this notice seeks input on protecting the privacy of calls and communications of survivors with hotlines and shelters. To begin, the notice seeks input on the universe of shelters, government or community-based programs, and hotlines that survivors may contact when fleeing violence or abuse. Next, the notice seeks input on the, the methods that may lessen the hesitancy of survivors in using communication services when seeking help, such as requiring or alternatively explicitly permitting service providers to omit records of communication account logs of both outbound and inbound calls and texts between survivors and abuse assistance hotlines and shelters. From there, the notice seeks input on how such an effort would interact with the general expectation that call and text logs are complete and reflect all communications as well as related issues concerning billing. As to implementation, the notice seeks input on how service providers could effectively implement these efforts, including creation of a new database or expanding or modifying an existing database. Lastly, the notice seeks information on the enforceability of these efforts and what penalties should apply for violators of any rules ultimately established. With respect to all aspects, the notice seeks input on the Commission's existing legal authority to implement these efforts as well as on how these proposals may promote or inhibit advances in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in accessibility. The Bureau recommends adoption of the Notice of Inquiry and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Well, thank you to the Bureaus, all the Bureaus, for your hard work on this item. Thank you so much uh, to the Chair for leading on this and bringing this forward. You know, as we heard from the, the presentation, um, you know, survivors can face all sorts of hurdles and challenges. We heard about financial dependence, just isolation, isolation in general, um, and having a reliable connection can be so vital in those dire circumstances. And you know, oftentimes continuing the cell phone or service plans uh, from the past are of absolutely no use, given what we've seen from patterns of stalking and other behaviors. Um, we have obviously a range of existing programs as we've noted and we note in the item, but those particular programs may have unique features that aren't well suited to being used immediately um, in the type of survivor environments that we're focused on here in the NOI. Uh, so I'm very happy to support this item. You know, thanks obviously again to the chair for, for thinking about how we can focus on this issue uh, and play at least some small part uh, in helping out here. So glad to support it. Thanks. Thanks. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. One of my goals as a commissioner is to ensure that all Americans have access to affordable, quality voice and broadband service. The need for connectivity is particularly acutely critical for our nation's most vulnerable populations. That includes those who we focus on here today survivors of domestic and sexual violence. Individuals fleeing or recovering from violence may be eligible for certain commission programs, but due to their circumstances, find that at their greatest hour of need, that they may be unable to clearly meet our enrollment rules. I feel strongly that in such cases, it is right for us to consider how and in what ways we can modify uh, in particular, Lifeline and uh, ACP program requirements to ensure access to these essential programs. Survivors may be trying to escape their abuser, looking for help from a hotline, living in or getting resources from a support shelter. I've seen firsthand the important work that support shelters in particular do to help those in need. Two immediately come to mind. Uh, just this last May, I visited the Hamilton families in San Francisco, a family-based shelter that had families there as I was there visiting, um, uh, supporting predominantly women uh, and children experiencing homelessness. Frequently, uh, they told me the result of fleeing an unsafe and unstable home life. I've also seen, of course, right here in DC in our backyard, visiting Miriam's Kitchen 
where I sat down with a number of guests there who shared their life story, as well as uh, speaking and meeting with the dedicated staff that help in individuals recovering from serious trauma. One refrain from those meetings that was consistent, empowering survivors to reach out when and how they see fit is a key part of supporting them as they look for a fresh start. It takes courage for an individual experiencing domestic or sexual violence to reach out for help. Victims that may be looking for help should feel confident that they can reach out to call or text a shelter or hotline for assistance without fear that their spouse or abuser may see a record of the call and act. So I'm very interested in the record that develops following this notice of inquiry. Assistance programs such as ACP and Lifeline are critical to supporting these individuals. Uh, I also would like to thank the chair for, um, uh, and, and of course the staff, for the great work and thinking uh, holistically on what we can do here. Uh, of course, also would like to thank Senator Schatz uh, for introducing the Safe Connections Act, which if adopted would provide a clear direction uh, to act on many of the questions that we are focused on here today. And so appreciate uh, the Senator's uh, continued leadership on this issue, uh, and I look forward to approving. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I'm happy to support this notice of inquiry into how our rules might account for the needs of victims of domestic violence and other crimes who depend on access to private communications for their safety. Thanks very much to the staff for your hard work on this item. Thank you, commissioners. Maybe you've heard of the shadow pandemic. It's the term used to describe the increase in domestic violence that has taken place since COVID lockdowns began more than two years ago. That's because when we shut our doors to protect against infection, abusers and their victims were trapped inside. They had few, if any, safe connections to the outside world. Those safe connections matter more than ever. Already one in four men and one in three women will experience domestic violence during their lifetime. It's increasing not just with this pandemic, but it may increase going forward too. That's because women face a greater risk of intimate partner violence during their reproductive years, including when they are pregnant. The ability to choose, the freedom to seek essential health care, and the right to be free of domestic violence are at risk. These are not abstractions. These are our friends, our families, and our neighbors. These are people you know who may have suffered during the pandemic and who may struggle in the days ahead. We need to ensure every one of them has a way to connect to the assistance they need for health care, for housing, and to be safe from those who would do them harm. This inquiry is an effort to do just that. We seek to understand how the FCC can assist survivors by exploring modifications to the Lifeline program and Affordable Connectivity program. Both of these programs provide essential connections that offer a meaningful way to reach out for help especially in environments where other communications may be monitored or controlled. For this reason, we explore how to provide temporary enrollment and how to protect call logs from showing efforts to reach domestic violence hotlines in order to ensure that survivors have the ability to seek the help they need safely and securely. This inquiry is consistent with proposals in the Safe Connections Act, and I really want to thank Senator Schatz, Senator Fisher, Representative Eshoo, and Representative Custer for their leadership on this legislative effort. I also want to thank the staff of the agency for their work here, including Pam Arlick, Jessica Campbell, Jody Griffin, Trent Hartgrader, Diane Holland, Ed Kratchmer, John Lockwood, Aurel Matthew, and Nick Page from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Melina Barzilai, Rick Mallon, Linda Oliver, and Elliot Tarloff from the Office of General Counsel. Mark Azik, Joanna Fisher, Eugene Kisilev, and Marcy Wakala from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Ed Bartholomew, Richard Smith, and Christy Thornton from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Garnet Hanley from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Tom Buckley, Mark Stevens, and Sanford Williams from the Office of Managing Director, and Pamela Gallant, Jeffrey G., Callan Lee, and Keith Morgan from the Enforcement Bureau. And with that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. 
Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Item four on your agenda titled Updating Resources Used to Determine Local TV Markets <clears throat> will be presented by the Media Bureau. Holly Sauer, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Sauer, please proceed. Good morning, Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today, the Media Bureau presents a notice of proposed rulemaking to update our rules when determining a television station's local market area. Presenting the item is Ken Lewis of the Policy Division. Ken? Good morning. Chairwoman and Commissioners, we are pleased to present this NPRM seeking comment on revising our rules to incorporate by reference a new publication that will be used to determine the designate market area or DMA of a local television broadcast station. Currently, television broadcasters, cable operators, and satellite carriers determine DMA for carriage election and other purposes by reference to the Nielsen Company's annual station index directory and station index United States television household estimates. The Nielsen Company has informed the commission that the annual station index will no longer be published and that the household estimates publication is no longer necessary to determine the station's DMA. Nielsen indicates that the annual station index has been replaced by a monthly local TV station information report, which generally contains the same information but is published monthly. Both the relevant statute and commission rules contemplate the adoption of a successor publication for determining DMA in the event that the Nielsen Annual Station Index is discontinued. This NPRN tentatively concludes that we should revise our rules to identify the Nielsen Local TV Report as that successor publication. The Annual Station Index used in each election cycle was based on information gathered by Nielsen in the month of October, two years prior to each carriage election. Therefore, using the local TV report for the month of October, two years prior to a carriage election deadline, would be an apples to apples replacement. The NPRM thus seeks comment on whether the commission should rely on the October 2021 report for the 2023 election or a different report published closer in time to the election. By updating our rules, we ensure that television broadcasters, cable operators, and satellite carriers will have the market information needed in advance of the 2023 carriage election cycle. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the NPRM and request editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Uh, thanks to the Bureau team for your work on this and identifying obviously a very uh, practical problem uh, that uh, needs to be addressed and fixed. So thanks for working it up and appreciate your work on it. Thanks. Commissioner Starks. Yes, I agree. Thank you for the hard work uh, on the team and making sure uh, that we are, 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 um, are focused on, you know, the station's local markets uh, for carriage purposes here. So thank you. All right, Commissioner Symington. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Today, we tentatively conclude to adopt Nielsen's local TV report as the successor publication to Nielsen's station index. Both the station index and the local TV report contain definitions for designated market areas, which the Commission critically relies on for many of the rights and obligations it creates within its rules. This is far from the only Nielsen data on which the Commission relies. The Commission looks to Nielsen to determine whether a broadcast station is significantly viewed outside of its market. Nielsen's market-level TV household estimates determine whether a station is within the top four in the market, impacting ownership possibilities for broadcasters, and whether a station is failing for the purposes of ownership rules, again, Nielsen. Indeed, something like 23 Commission rules reference Nielsen in some way. The Commission relies heavily on Nielsen and has for decades, and in the ordinary course, Following uncontroversial principles of good governance, the public might well expect the Commission to routinely canvass the industry for alternative data providers, comparing products across the sector, ensuring that our reliance on Nielsen is well-founded so that the Commission can say with confidence that our regulatees, and above all the American people, are well-served by the data sources on which we at the Commission rely. 
it's a big deal to have your company formally blessed by being specified by name as the basis of regulatory determinations. And it's not the case everywhere. For example, in the financial sector, the Securities and Exchange Commission establishes criteria for designating companies as nationally recognized statistical ratings organizations, or NRSROs, for purposes of investment ratings. Companies can apply for and lose NRSRO status, and NRSROs, not specific firms, are mentioned and required in applicable laws and rules. There's an obvious reason, though, why we don't do this at the FCC. For most commission purposes, there is no one else in the industry. Nielsen is the only game in town. There may be a little hemming and hawing here or there about that assertion, but those who know, know. Nielsen has ruled the, meetings, uh, uh, the ra media ratings world for decades. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but as we've all learned from the supply chain crises during the pandemic, it's worth looking at bottlenecks, choke points, and single points of failure. Does it work here? Well, let's see. The Media Ratings Council, or MRC, which is the accrediting body for media ratings agencies, de-accredited Nielsen last year for, quote, deep-rooted ongoing performance issues, uh, quote, that predated the issues Nielsen encountered in paneling viewers and listeners during COVID. And Nielsen has yet to regain its full accreditation. Now, I'm confident that Nielsen will work diligently to correct the defects in its methodology identified by the MRC and that it will regain its accreditation. But I think it gives us pause, or should, that the Commission is functionally obligated to adopt presently unaccredited data and definitions because, uh, as Nielsen has little competition, the Commission is left with no other obvious choice. Might our obligation to act in the public interest even require us to, where possible, encourage innovation or even just an alternative in broadcast viewership and listenership analytics? so that we avoid subjecting American media to the single point of failure in our broadcast regulatory regime? A lot is at stake here. If broadcasters are effectively obligated to purchase and rely on data that may be inaccurate, are they be being given the tools to compete and grow? If a data provider exercises its dominant market position to extract higher prices for data that are functionally compulsory for broadcasters in small markets, are we discouraging localism? If advertisers believe that the main source of viewership and listenership data that they use to make buys on broadcast stations is unreliable, might that push them away from broadcast and toward online advertising platforms where data may be considered more reliable? That third question in particular may have been appropriate to ask a decade ago, but I think we can consider it by now answered with advertisers' wallets. The broadcast industry has been losing to online platforms in the advertising competition. Of course, there are reasons for this outside of the accuracy and completeness of audience analytics. The secular trend of media consumption is toward online platforms, which drives the advertising dollar. Sure. But it is, not, it, it, is it not at least worth taking into account that among the considerations that advertisers, especially small businesses, cite for doing online advertising is the high trust that they place on granular audience analytics? Because let's be clear. Big tech platforms do pr this pretty well. They have to. Their product offerings rely on their analytical performance. Facebook consumer data breadth and quality has been a key value proposition since before its IPO. Apple stitches together an impression from millions of data signals gathered and provides that data in anonymized but granular fashion to its partners. The pitch for Google is that they know what you want when you search and serve you up the right ad at the right time. The pitch for Amazon is that they know what you buy and when and recommend to you the right product at the right time. And of course, I could go on. Doubtlessly, the, the accuracy and completeness of the data each of these services provide drive, at least in part, the commercial value of these companies and firm decisions uh, to partner with them as an advertising or sales platform. We can leave CPM online versus offline out of the equation for now, except to note that for online companies, it is intrinsically low, so offline companies have even more reason to try to compete on the data quality side of the equation. There's no reason to think that only online companies can do good analytics. The big credit bureaus have decades of your financial history and provide simple tools and scores to help creditors evaluate that information. Credit card processors can generate excellent insights based on purchase patterns. And even direct mail analytics are pretty good. But there are reasons that it's hard to generate broadcast analytics. Over-the-air broadcast, by design, does not have an intrinsic data return path. Even ATSC 3.0's return path will be delivered over the internet, not over the air, unless you're using a fixed wireless ISP. So anyone doing broadcast analytics must overcome limitations not experienced by digital analytics. But is enough care being given to overcome those limitations? Both broadcasters and advertisers have long asked these questions. And I'm not yet satisfied, considering the present unaccredited status of Nielsen, that the answer is an obvious yes. Today's item makes a ministerial change in our rules, and I'm happy to, to support it because so much of what we do relies on Nielsen data. Perhaps that reliance is ultimately warranted. 
but I don't believe that I could confidently tell the American public that we have proven that it is. And I think we owe it to the public to know for sure that we are justified in relying on a source that is quite literally written into our rules. I therefore believe the Commission should consider opening a notice of inquiry related to Nielsen's inclusion in nearly two dozen Commission rules and the Commission's uh, reliance on Nielsen data. If there are opportunities to identify or generate new sources of broadcast data, we should take them. If there are improvements to be made in our usage of broadcast data, we should make them. And if our ties to Nielsen ultimately represent a structural impediment to the public interest, necessity, and convenience, we should break them. My thanks to the Media Bureau and Chairwoman Rosenworcel and her staff for their diligent work in not just drafting this item, but in working closely with my office on edits, and I, I support this item. Thank you, Commissioners. The ways we watch are changing. It used to be that households gathered at night to bask in the glow of a single television screen and watch what was on when it was on. But the screens in our lives have multiplied and the ways to measure what we view and consume have changed. I mean, that's definitely the case in my house and I'm sure it's true for millions and millions of others across the country. Still, some things stay the same. Broadcast television stations that seek to make it on the channel lineup of traditional cable and satellite systems and want to negotiate for carriage are going to have to do so through the retransmission consent system. This system is set in the law. For more than two decades, television stations, cable operators, and satellite providers have all used the same publication released annually by Nielsen to determine each station's local market. It's a reference point in this system that helps ensure consumers get local programming. In fact, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 actually directed the FCC to rely on commercial publications to establish local market viewing patterns. And then three years later, in the Satellite Home Viewer Act, Congress amended copyright law and specifically defined the local market as determined by a Nielsen publication. But back to things changing. That's because Nielsen recently chose to discontinue its commercial publication that has historically been used in this process and is referenced in the law. So onward, we're taking note of the fact that the law provides us with the opportunity to consider a successor publication in the event the original Nielsen publication is no longer available. This rulemaking kicks off that effort. This is complicated, but the reality is simple. We are watching more content over more screens than ever before, and in a world where viewing can sometimes feel infinite, we want to make sure that every household has the opportunity to receive local television stations with news and programming from where they live. This is about updating a data report behind our policies to make sure they can do so. So thank you to the staff working on this rulemaking, including Kenneth Lewis, Evan Baranoff, Lyle Elder, Maria Malarkey, and Michelle Carey of the Media Bureau. Susan Aaron, Dave Consul, and William Richardson of the Office of General Counsel. Mark Montano, Kim Makich, and Andrew Wise of the Office of Economics and Analytics. And Belford Lawson of the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. And with that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. <coughs> Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. And the chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, can you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item five on your agenda is an enforcement matter and it will be presented by the Enforcement Bureau. Leon Egal, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. So now for a little boilerplate. Because this is an enforcement matter, we're gonna switch the order up slightly just as the Commission has done in past cases that involve similar presentations at an open meeting. As with all open meeting items, the Bureau circulated this to every Commissioner at least three weeks ago, but there is a long-standing practice at the agency that we do not publish or disclose pre-decisional awards unless and until the Commission decides to take action. For these types of items, that means the agency formally votes on the item, then here's a brief presentation from the Bureau before proceeding to any statements that the commissioners might have. This process helps ensure that these sensitive matters will not be publicly disclosed until the FCC has voted to take action. And we are following that precedent here. So we will now proceed directly to a vote on item five. Commissioner Carr. 
Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges if requested. Mr. Egal, please proceed with introducing this item on today's agenda. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and good morning, commissioners. Thank you for your consideration of today's vote, your vote on today's item, which comes on the heels of significant actions taken by the Enforcement Bureau last week against individuals and entities we believe to be involved in facilitating the unprecedented prol proliferation of unlawful robocalls. The item before you today is a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture addressing apparent violations of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Presenting with me is Daniel Stepanisich, Attorney Advisor in the Enforcement Bureau's Telecommunications Consumers Division. Daniel will now present the item. Thank you, Leon. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. This Notice of Apparent Liability, or NAL, proposes a $116,156,250 forfeiture against Thomas Dorscher and his companies for apparent violations of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, or TCPA. Over the course of approximately two months in early 2021, Dorsher apparently made nearly 10 million pre-recorded voice message calls to toll-free numbers without consent. The robocalls purported to be public service announcements informing the recipient about the harms of scams and that the recipient should report such calls to the FCC, uh, the recipient's carrier, and Dorsher's website, scammerblaster.com. Bureau staff have verified 20,650 of these robocalls for violations of the TCPA. The TCPA violations appear to have been intentional. Dorsher apparently targeted toll-free numbers because he received compensation for each call placed to a toll-free number. When a caller makes a toll-free call, the toll-free service provider, typically a long-distance carrier, pays the caller's local exchange carrier, or LEC, for originating the call and for, per for performing the toll-free database query. The called party, the customer that is assigned the toll-free number, compensates the toll-free service provider for completing the call. Unscrupulous actors can abuse this compensation scheme uh, in what is known as access stimulation or traffic pumping. When a LEC is engaged in access stimulation traffic pumping, it will often share the compensation with its caller, uh, caller customers to pump more traffic across its network. Dorsher apparently had such a, uh, an arrangement with his LEC. Dorsher apparently uses uh, this revenue that he obtains from his LEC for his robocalls to toll-free numbers to fund telephone denial of service or TDOS attacks against what Dorsher characterizes as verified scammers. TDOS attacks are extremely reckless and dangerous as they can interfere with emergency services. The Bureau uncovered evidence that Dorsher directed TDOS attacks against innocent parties. While this notice of apparent li liability factors in the TDOS calls for an upward adjustment of the proposed forfeiture, it only assesses a per call penalty for the pre-recorded voice message calls to toll free numbers and not the TDOS calls. The evidence in the record indicates that Dorsher did not have consent or an emergency purpose for his robocalls. In fact, a toll-free subscriber would have a disincentive to consent to receive pre-recorded voice message calls. For these reasons and additional detail laid out in the notice of apparent liability, the Enforcement Bureau appreciates the Commission's adoption of this item and grant of editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Uh, thanks for, to the team for your <clears throat> work on this. I gotta say, I was very shocked to find out that uh, Scammer Blaster was the name of a company that was maybe engaged in business that wasn't entirely above board. I mean, that's like going to Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe as a law firm and being shocked at what you get. But at least maybe it makes it a little bit easier for us to identify them. Um, in all seriousness, though, obviously we need to continue the work that we're doing to crack down on these types of um, schemes and scams. I was just testifying yesterday uh, in Congress, and obviously there's just continues to be a lot of interest uh, and desire for the FC to move forward on robocalls. So I'm glad we're taking another sort of concrete step uh, here. So thanks to the team for all your, your hard work on this. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. We continue to be faced with egregious actions by bad actors using illegal robocalls. This one is particularly striking as well here. Uh, Dorsher and his companies were engaged in willful and repeated conduct that violated federal law, the Commission's rules. In less than three months, Dorsher placed more than 9 million robocalls to toll-free numbers. Each of these calls generated income for him, 
and his companies through an access stimulation agreement at the expense of toll-free subscribers, which he then used to fund dangerous telephone denial of service attacks. These are the types of attacks that are highly hazardous as they disable telephone networks and can disrupt critical emergency services. Dorsher acknowledged, not only acknowledged that he made these robocalls to fund his other illegal behavior, but when confronted by those affected by these robocalls, Dorsher threatened them, reasoning that he was beyond the reach of the law. His disregard for the welfare of consumers on top of his illegal activities justifies the significant fine we adopt here today. Of course, uh, as I already did, I supported this item, and stopping illegal robocalls is the Commission's top consumer priority. We must continue to remain aggressive in the fight to bring consumers relief and vindication from these harmful intrusions. Additionally, we closely monitor 911 outages of all types, including for cyber attacks on our telephone networks, and that is another place where we must re remain diligent. And to close, you know, I've repeatedly said there are a number of hurdles that the Enforcement Bureau and teams face in finding these bad actors in the first place, and then even bringing them to account for violations of our rules. That we continue to pursue these cases demonstrates the Commission's resolve uh, in protecting consumers and, of course, should drive deterrence, uh, a hallmark of any justified enforcement action. Thank you to the team for the hard work. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. I'd like to thank uh, Enforcement Bureau for its hard work on this and uh, no further comments. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioners. I, too, can't believe that we are dealing here with a company called Scammer Blaster. <laughs> and they're involved in a big scam. And that scam involved millions and millions of robocalls. And I detest robocalls. And ultimately, I believe if we want to stop them, we are going to need both defense and offense. So in the defensive zone, two weeks ago, we required small carriers to implement stir shaken technology. This call authentication system, it helps catch junk calls and it is already in place in the networks of our largest carriers. But now we're requiring it in the networks of smaller providers and specifically those that we believe may be turning a blind eye to these kind of calling scams. In the offensive zone, last week we started an enforcement action to go after the scammers behind billions of auto warranty calls. And it began with an eight cease and desist letters to carriers we believe are responsible for these calls, directing them to knock it off in 48 hours or we will tell every other carrier to not carry their traffic. At the same time, on this issue, we're working closely with the Attorney General of Ohio and our ongoing investigation to hold those behind this fraud accountable. It's worth noting that our offensive game has a bigger team than ever before. In fact, as of today, we have state attorneys general in 41 states, plus the District of Columbia and Guam, working with us through a memorandum of understanding to share resources to fight illegal robocalls. Our work with the Attorney General of Ohio is already evidence that this approach is making a difference. Now, today's enforcement action is also part of our offensive effort. We propose a more than $116 million fine for a scammer responsible for traffic pumping scheme that was all built on robocalls. This fine is big, but it also calls attention to the fact that we need new rules of the game. We have issued many fines just like this one, but after we do, we have to hand them over to our colleagues at the Department of Justice and hope for further action. Now, I like hope, but instead of wishing for the best, I would like the certainty of this agency being able to go to court directly and collect fines from these bad actors, each and every one of them. This will take a change in the law, and we will need Congress to fix that. But I think this is robocall change worth fighting for. Thank you to the staff responsible for this enforcement action, including Loyani Gal, Lisa Gelb, Jermaine Haynes, Bal Balki McCauley, Daniel Stepanisic, Christy Thompson, Ashley Tyson, and Lisa Zena from the Enforcement Bureau, Ed Bartholomew, Mark Stone, and Christy Thornton from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Mark Montano and Michelle Schlafer from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Valerie Hill, Richard Mallon, Wissam Naum, and William Richardson from the Office of General Counsel, and Pamela Arluck, Matthew Collins, Lynn Engeldow, Heather Hendrickson, Zachary Ross, Michelle Slater, Jill Gil Strobel and David Zeisiger from the Wireline Competition Bureau. 
And with that, we are going to close out the meeting. So would any of my colleagues like to make announcements at this time? We'll start with Commissioner Carr. I do. Give me a, give me a second, though. Oh, we caught you off guard. Yep. Uh, so a couple announcements. One is our uh, summer legal intern, uh, Brittany Darrow. Brittany, are you here? You got to stand up and wave to everybody. It's a rite of passage, unfortunately. I had to do it once when I interned uh, for a commissioner as well. Uh, she's from uh, Los Angeles, California, an incoming senior at the University of Pennsylvania, majoring in economics and minoring in legal Please studies. Please turn on history. your microphone. Uh, she spent uh, last summer as a congressional intern in uh, Leader McCarthy's office, and she's currently working as a research assistant at the Wharton School, focusing primarily on administrative law, thankfully for us. Um, if we don't dissuade her here, she plans to go to law school eventually and pursue a career in government work. So hopefully we are incentivizing that, not disincentivizing it. Uh, but Brittany's been doing great work uh, already for the office and helped staff and join us up on the Hill yesterday for a hearing and has really pitched in on a lot that the office is doing, uh, so thanks so much to her. Uh, we also have a unfortunate departure from the office, uh, a detailee, uh, Michael Nemsik, who is here somewhere. Uh, Michael was a former car office intern, uh, and while my legal advisor, Danielle, has been on maternity leave, he's come up for a couple months here and pitched in, and it's just been uh, absolutely fantastic. And having seen Michael uh, as an intern a couple years ago, uh, and see him now as well. Um, it, it's just amazing to see uh, how he's continuing to, you know, grow his skills as a lawyer, uh, starting to understand some of the, you know, the policy side, advising of the job, as well, and is on just a wonderful trajectory here as an honors attorney. Uh, hopefully, he'll be warmly welcomed back uh, into the fold of the bureau uh, after his stint up here. And we're obviously looking forward to having uh, Danielle back. I think sometime next week. Um, so a little bit of turnover in the office, but but thanks again, Michael, for all your, your service and uh, welcome aboard to Brittany. All right, Commissioner Starks. Yes, uh, I just want to quickly highlight, uh, if folks otherwise haven't, go check out the James Webb Space Telescope <laughs> images. They are absolutely <laughs> breathtaking. Uh, the start of the universe, the deepest infrared images. I'm trying to figure out an FCC hook. They're a sister agency here. Mm -hmm. A lot of media push, but it really uh, is absolutely spectacular. Ooh, totally agree. Uh, Commissioner Symington. Thank you very much. Uh, no announcements. All right, I've got a few. Um, let me start by at the top thanking Linda Oliver, who is the Associate General Counsel, who is our stand-in for the General Counsel today. We appreciate you being here and your help and assistance. I also want to announce a retirement for over 27 years. Jordan Brin has worked at the FCC, primarily in the audio division of the Media Bureau, although he also spent some time at the agency in the Office of Public Affairs, and he is retiring shortly, and we want to wish him all the best in his retirement. We'll miss his upbeat attitude and quiet confidence. Thank you for spending so much time in public service at the FCC. I also want to acknowledge that Michelle Carey received the Federal Communications Bar Association's 15th Annual Excellence in Government Service Award. It's an award that recognizes federal government employees who are dedicated to the pursuit of excellence in public service, and Michelle is a fitting recipient. She started at the agency in 1994 and has served many different roles since then. In fact, she was my boss when I first came to this agency as a staff attorney. So I want to congratulate Michelle for the recognition and for her contributions. I also want to acknowledge that the World Telecommunications Development Conference, which we sometimes call the WTDC, was just held in Kigali, Rwanda from June 6th to June 16th. And the purpose of this conference was to set the objectives and strategies for the direction and guidance we're providing to the ITU Development Bureau and its leadership. And at this conference, Roxane McElvain Weber, who is the Deputy Chief of the Global Strategies and Negotiation Division of IB was elected chair of the Telecommunications Development Advisory Group. This is a really important advisory group that reviews priorities, strategies, operations, and financial matters for the ITU de telecommunications development sector. And she was recognized for her excellent leadership in this position during the prior four-year term, and she was unanimously reelected to this important post. So congratulations, Roxanne. It is good news for the ITU, the FCC, and of course, uh, world communications. 
Next, I want to draw a little attention to some changes in my own office. We're going to start with Carmen Scarato, who this week we welcome to the office. She comes to us from Free Press. She previously worked at the National Hispanic Media Coalition and with the Department of Justice. And we are very excited to have her. She will be working on consumer issues as well as public safety matters. We're thrilled she's joining us in the Rose and Warsaw office, but also at the FCC. And I also want to acknowledge we're going to shift some other people around as a result of Carmen's arrival. And so I really want to call out David, Ethan, and Ramesh for their continued service to the commission. In particular, I want to acknowledge that David Strickland is now advising on media issues. Uh, Ethan is now going to be serving us as legal advisor for wireless and international issues, and Ramesh is going to take on an additional role. He is going to take on enforcement-related issues on top of his work on wireline competition matters. We've got lots of complex challenges going ahead, and I am thrilled to have this team in place working with me and working with the agency to address them. Finally, I just have to say one more time, I am thrilled that we are sitting in this room right here, right now, and I really want to thank a lot of the people who helped make this happen, and especially the FCC's uh, Safer Federal Workforce Task Force, who has been consistently thoughtful and helpful as we've navigated the unprecedented during these pandemic days. And with that, Madam Secretary, will you announce the next date for the Commission's monthly meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Friday, August 5th, 2022. And with that, we stand adjourned. Where's your share one? Well, thank you, Paloma, and thank you for everyone being here. It is um, strange and novel to be in this building and to use this room this way, but it's also a little bit thrilling. I'm so glad that we have been able to welcome people back publicly to the FCC, and I thank you for your patience as we have navigated these unprecedented times and this pandemic. Uh, I do want to draw attention to just a handful of things. First, uh, we had a very creative effort to try to improve deployment of wireless service in rural areas and on tribal lands today with our ESIP proposal. I'm looking forward to what results from that effort. I also want to point out that we had a very large fine for a bad actor from a robocalling company called Scammer Blaster. And um, I'm glad that we were able to uh, reach a decision on that. Finally, I want to point out that Saturday, after several years of work, the 988 Suicide and Mental Crisis Hotline will be up and running. That three-digit number is going to be available with both phone and text. And I'm proud of the technical work that the FCC has done under my leadership and under the leadership of my predecessor to make that happen. And with that, I'm going to take some questions. How do we start this? We'll start right like that. Uh, Monty Taylor, Com Daily. Uh, yes, Chairwoman. Uh, I was wondering if um, if you can tell us what the status is of the foreign uh, sponsorship rules after the court's ruling. Are broadcasters still going to need to, to do those disclosures and stuff? Because it seemed like the court only knocked down part of it, but you were saying on Twitter that everything got blocked. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering what what the state of that is. What are broadcasters supposed to be doing? First, I'll just point out that it is a long-standing tenet of broadcasting that those who are watching deserve to know by whom they are being persuaded. The policies we adopted were fundamentally about transparency. Transparency is important, especially here when public airwaves are leased out by foreign government programming. Disclosure matters. Now, under our existing rules, they will have to disclose in the public file and at the time of airing, but it's my understanding from that opinion that they do not have to make the effort to look in the FARA database to identify if they are a registered foreign agent. We are reviewing this decision and deciding how to proceed, but I think that these matters deserve future consideration because they are about transparency, and I think we can do more to support that. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Thanks for having us here. Howard Busker, Communications Daily. Um, 
I hadn't thought out where I was sitting in terms of not necessarily having a question ready quite yet, but it's I guess a test. I knew, it's a test. Right. <laughs> I, was, I guess I'll, I was going to ask about um, 12 gigahertz. There's been an, an awful lot on that, as you know, and you know, back and forth on that. And can you give us any um, updates, sort of, on your thinking on that particular item? And any, if you want to just tell us what to expect, that would be great. So thank you. It's a really complex proceeding. We have. A very substantial technical review that's underway. Um, and in fact, we received more technical information in our docket on this about uh, three weeks ago that we are still sorting through. At the same time, we've gotten lots of consumers filing in our comment system offering their thoughts about this. And recently, we released a decision on Earth stations in motion that also implicated these issues, though we reserve judgment for broader 12 gigahertz issues with respect to terrestrial vis-a-vis -vis satellite going forward. So we are still doing the technical review. Our docket continues to grow, and it's taken a lot of time and resources, but that's okay because we want to reach the right answer. Gabriella Novello, Communications Daily. Um, so as you know, NTIA announced yesterday that all states and territories have signed on for the BEAD program. So now um, with the map making process, uh, what is the FCC doing to work with NTIA to make sure they have the, the best map possible before money starts going out the door? We are coordinating with NTIA like never before. I uh, think I've spoken to Alan once this week and has seen him twice. Uh, so on a person to person level, there is more engagement between our agencies than I think there has ever been in history. That's a good thing because we have more work to do together than ever before. That includes updating our spectrum practices so we coordinate better. We are finalizing a memorandum of understanding to that effect. And then also making sure that they are in the know about where we stand with mapping. And the most important thing to know about that is that on June 30th, we opened our systems for the more than 2,500 carriers to file their data with us. And so we are reaching out to those who are required to file. We're also reaching out to state broadband officers and any individuals who are interested in this process to make sure that they understand how it works and they understand how to file during this window and in the challenge process thereafter. All of this work is being discussed on a nearly daily basis between my staff, my office, the agency, and our colleagues at NTIA. Lynn Stanton from TR Daily. Uh, yesterday, the House Energy and Commerce Committee approved the, uh, the Safe Connections Act, which you had mentioned uh, in talking about the domestic abuse item. Do you view what Congress is proposing to do in that bill as necessary for, can the FCC do that on their own if, if it doesn't get through Congress or? Well, I appreciate that there is a version of the Safer Connections Act that al already passed the Senate, and now we have a version that, as of yesterday, passed through the House Energy and Commerce Committee. I think all of this effort, including ours right here today, shows you that there is a lot of interest in identifying how the Lifeline Program and Affordable Connectivity Program can be used to assist survivors of domestic violence. And we welcome all those additional authorities. We, uh, if this becomes the law, we will find out how to incorporate them in our inquiry here. And um, I am hopeful we're going to be able to act in this area. But what we have right now is an exploration of our existing authorities. Should that change if Congress passes a law, we'll make adjustments. But I am um, optimistic we're going to be able to proceed. Thank you. Hey, John Hendel, Politico. Um, tomorrow's a big day for the Rep and Replace program. I know there's some announcements coming then. Um, wanted to kind of ask, you know, I know you would mentioned previously that, you know, there was some thought about prorating some of the money if there's not, like, the full amount necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, one to ask if that's still the expectation, how soon any of that money might get out there, and kind of what the broader timeline around any of this would look like at this point, and if there's any sense of urgency for some of the smaller carriers, too. Given I know they've been kind of frozen in place with the Huawei and ZTE gear, can't necessarily replace some of that. You know, wanted to know if you've been hearing about those concerns and what that would mean, you know, as we await those uh, replacements. Well, yes to all of the above, and as you may know, I committed to complete our review on July 15th, which is tomorrow, and I don't want to get ahead of the Bureau, but uh, during our last update to Congress, we acknowledged that we had 181 applications. We found that 122 of them were lacking in some documentation. So we gave those applicants the opportunity to update their filings with us so that we have a final figure about how much funding was actually requested. That's important so that we can make it known to Congress just how much in funding was demanded and how much it would take to fully rip and replace that equipment out. 
Now, in the event that we don't have that full funding figure from Congress, the way FCC rules work is that we would fund cents on the dollar for all of the applicants in the first priority under the law. As if you recall, the way that Congress set up the law, the first priority group was applicants with 2,000 or less subscribers. In other words, carriers with 2,000 or less, two, excuse me, 2 million or less lines. The second group was uh, educational institutions and healthcare institutions. And the third group was carriers with 10 million or fewer lines. And so Congress set up a system where there are say, three parts to it and three levels of priority. And the FCC has a system which within those buckets of priority would apply the funds available to uh, the carriers in first the first bucket, then the second bucket, and then the third bucket. So it's a complex interaction of FCC rules and congressional law. And so that's how we're going to proceed. But we'll have some more information on just what those figures look like tomorrow. Hi, Chairwoman. Uh, Chris Cole with Law 360. I just wanted to ask, uh, did you have a reaction or what would, was your reaction to the West Virginia versus EPA ruling? Um, also, kind of more broadly building on that, are you concerned about chipping away of Chevron deference in terms we're, of the FCC policy? We're taking a look at that ruling uh, as we are an administrative agency, but I have confidence that we have broad authorities under the Communications Act. Can you speak to the FCC maps? Are they still expected to come out in the end of the, or in the fall? Yes, uh, we opened a window to take in data from carriers. That window is open under our rules from June 30th to September 1st. After we take that data in, we will sort it, assess it, and we will open for challenges to uh, the uh, availability that was reported during this uh, system window. And uh, our, all systems are, uh, are working right now, so we look forward to having a map in the fall. Madeline Hughes, The Well News. Um, so right now, the BEAD program is um, up and running and states are getting funding for this broadband, um, but there's a lack of workers um, in a lot of these places um, to implement this, and is that a concern for the commission as you guys are giving out this funding and having deadlines on that? So the funding for the BEAD program is going to be distributed by our colleagues at NTIA and not the FCC. So I feel like in the first instance, that's their, uh, their issue to address, but we're mindful of it and we're in very close contact with them um, because we're gonna have to take considerations on the ground. Uh, you know, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to take those things into consideration as we proceed. Uh, David Dumalfetta with S&P Market Intelligence. Just on national security matters, I'm wondering if the commission is considering any other enforcement actions or anything thereof in the future against uh, China telcos, Russian telcos. We haven't seen any items on that for a little while. So I'm just wondering uh, where you or the commission stands on that. I have nothing to report on that at this time. Sanya Rao with CTFN. I was hoping you can talk to us a bit about the UHF discount in deal spending approval and how that factors into the FCC, FC, current FCC's decision making. Well, the UHF discount is still a rule that's on our books. It, it dates back to a much earlier era in broadcasting and the technical underpinnings for it are no longer true since the digital television transition. I recognize it's still in our rules and it is uh, a factor that um, applicants when they file before us take into consideration because it's on our books. But I don't have anything specific to mention about it at this time. All right, that's it. Thank you all for joining us here. Um, I, uh, I hope we'll be able to do this again next month. That is the plan. And if you've got some great power to help us with this virus, I encourage you to use it. <laughs>
let me know if you have any questions. We'll call them up. Um, so does anyone have, any, have anyone have any questions for the Wireless Bureau on the Enhanced Competitive Incentive Program? Okay. Joel and team, all right. Howard, is that you? Thank you for um, sticking around for this. Um, we normally ask, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion of the item in terms of any changes that had been made since while it was before the commissioners, and we'd heard that it was pretty minimal, but can you give us any color on whether there were any changes uh, to the item from the draft that, that, that were at least somewhat noteworthy? Sure. You mean since the uh, the public release of the draft? Yeah, since the since the draft ago. was released three weeks ago. Yeah. Y yeah. I mean, not not a lot of major changes. Um, I, I think you heard Commissioner Starks refer to um, uh, one uh, change that that he had requested uh, in the further notice regarding um, seeking comment on um, how to best configure our build out rules to um, to match uh, how private wireless networks are deployed. Um, so that was one change, but uh, other than that, nothing, nothing particularly major. Well, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Does anyone else have any questions on this item? Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. All right. Next up, um, are there two? Um, there were two wireline bureau items, both the access arbitrage item and the NOI on uh, supporting survivors. Do folks have questions on? Great. So Trent. Team. So, who, so who had a Gabriella? Go first. So, on the um, the access stimulation item, I know U.S. Telecom and Lumen both um, sought some clarifying language. Were either of those taken into consideration in the final item? Were there other changes? So, yes, we did take into consideration some of the language that U.S. Telecom had suggested to us, uh, particularly about. Um, other network arrangements that we should just pose some questions about it as a further notice. And so we took those because we thought it was um, the best thing to see what reactions we could get from from the commenters out there. There were no other changes, uh, particularly from any of the other offices. Anything else, Gabriela? Is there another question? Hi. Hi. I was just wondering if there were any other loopholes that uh, this proposed rule doesn't address. Um, talks about IPES. Any other issues that need that the agency needs to confront? So I, there could be, and that's one of the reasons why we're doing this as a further notice. We're seeking public comment on this. As you heard from the bench up here in 2019, the commission put in put in place this access arbitrage. Restrictions, and we're going to, you know, closely monitor what's going on out, out in the industry, and that's why we did the item that we did today, so that we can seek further comment on it, see if there's other ideas, see if we're seeing other things out there that we need to write rules for. Um, so, TBD, when you know, if and when we go to order on this, um, we will have uh, we'll have a better idea of what's going on out there. Great, thanks. Any other questions for the Wireline Bureau? Yeah, yeah, any of the items that are on the agenda. For this Sorry, Lynn Stanton, Tier Daily. Um, were there any um, changes from the draft item? There were not. Thank you. Any other questions for the Bureau? Okay, hearing none. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, uh, the Media Bureau on determining local markets. Monty? I could have guessed that, Monty. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just generally wanted to know what had changed, if anything, from the drafts on both of those media items. Uh, Mr. Simington had that long talk about Nielsen stuff. Did that end up affecting how the item came out? Yeah, so first on the Part 74 item, there were no edits. Uh, it was okay. voted early. Um, on the uh, Nielsen item, um, at the request of the Simington office, we did add a footnote 
um, noting the deaccreditation of Nielsen, the current status of that um, effort, and the f and also noted that there are no alternatives to Nielsen that are currently accredited. Any other questions to the bureau? Great, thank you. Okay, and uh, last but certainly not least, the Enforcement Bureau, do you have any questions on the $116 million robocall fine uh, for the toll-free number pumping? No? Okay, great. Well, that'll do it for the Bureau press conference. Uh, thank you all, and I think uh, Commissioner Carr is going to take your questions as well. So it's good to see you all, and see you guys later. Person. I'm glad I don't have to enter any conference code and mess that up before uh, getting to talk with you all. I think since we last uh, had a post-meeting presser, one thing we've done is we released our wireless resiliency order. The text of it, I think, has now been publicly available for a week or so. Really glad that we got that across the finish line, worked well together on a bipartisan basis to do something that I think is both important uh, and at, at another level, common sense. Uh, yesterday, I had the chance to testify in the House, including on issues dealing with TikTok. I obviously had sent a letter a couple of weeks ago um, raising some serious concerns, particularly in light of this recent reporting uh, that BuzzFeed News has done, where they obtained the leaked audio of internal TikTok and, to some extent, TikTok bike dance meetings. And despite years of uh, assurances from TikTok officials that the data is stored in the U.S., that they don't share it uh, with the Chinese government, the BuzzFeed News report said that, according to the quotes, that they have everything is seen in China. And since then, I've been very pleased to see the very broad bipartisan interest in this issue. As you probably saw, um, Democrat Chair of Senate Intel, Mark Warner, as long as, with, along with the Vice Chair, Marco Rubio, wrote a letter to the FTC asking them to launch sort of an immediate federal investigation into this. There were some more letters today from leaders in uh, House Commerce and House Oversight uh, focused on the same cluster of issues. Um, I know Josh Rogan, Washington Post, did, did a column on this as well. So there's really broad, deep, bipartisan concern. And frankly, the more words that uh, TikTok offers in the press to defend their current practices, the more concerning it is to me. Uh, because in all of their representations, they are not addressing one of the core concerns that's been raised, which is how much of this data that's going back to China has been accessed by members of the CCP. Instead, they, they come back with various dodges of, again, we don't share or it's stored here. Um, so their attempts to address this, such as it is, uh, really only uh, deepen and highlight uh, the concern. So with that, though, happy to open up to any questions that you all have. Uh, yeah, what should the FCC do about the foreign sponsorship uh, court ruling? Uh, what do you think the next step should be? Should the rules stay as they are, or is there some other thing you guys should do? I think transparency makes a whole heck of a lot of sense, uh, particularly when we're seeing, you know, um, the potential or the rise for, for foreign influence campaigns, whether it's out of China, whether it's out of Russia. Um, I voted for and supported the decision, and I'd be happy to work with the chair on next steps to make sure that we are promoting, you know, basic core tenets of transparency, whatever that next step may or may not be, but happy to work with her and my colleagues um, to make sure that we have the level of transparency so that people can be empowered uh, to make informed decisions. Uh, Howard Busker, Communications Daily. I had just two quick things. One was um, I'd asked the chairwoman about 12 gigahertz, and um, I know that people also have been talking about your stand on that. Um, is there any, has that, are you sort of where you were a couple months ago, or have you, has that moved at all? I mean, where, 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 what do you see as the outlook for 12 gigahertz right now? Yeah, no, nothing new on my end, no new movement from my perspective. I'm still in the same spot, um, which is I'm happy to get to a win-win if we can continue to have um, all the public interest benefits of uh, functioning uh, LEO systems uh, and do more there terrestrially. That's a win-win, uh, and I'm happy to get there. Ultimately, that's going to come down to uh, a very technical analysis. Um, I'm not sure if the Bureau has completed their technical review or not, uh, but once that process comes to a close, I'm happy to, to talk to the Bureau and see, you know, what does the engineering show is possible here. Okay. And then something else that's fairly recent that um, has gotten a lot of attention 
One of, one of the other reporters asked about the recent Supreme Court decision, the EPA decision, you know, and, and there, there's a lot of tea leaf re, re, reading right now in terms of how the, what does that mean for Chevron and, and how, how, how do you read the situation right now as do you watch the court in terms of um, the amount of deference they're likely to give? Uh, do you think that's going to be more constrained in the future? Well, look, I mean, EPA at its core is a decision about, you know, respecting the power and authority of Congress. And when they have, you know, very clearly delegated authority um, to an agency, then the agency obviously has, you know, uh, room within that delegation to regulate. Um, but I think, you know, the major questions doctrine and the reinvigoration of that ultimately underscores um, that it's Congress's prerogative to delineate uh, the outlines of an agency's authority and issues they can address. Um, and that courts are going to enforce to make sure that we, uh, as an agency, stay within our lane. And so we'll see, have to see how that plays out in any, you know, particular case based on the exact terms, not just of the Communications Act, but of the particular statutory provisions that we're um, purporting to regulate under. And, and people instantly mention net neutrality as being an example of an area where it could undermine, it could affect the the FCC's ability to do more on that, in term, especially in terms of Title II. Any thoughts on that? You know, it's possible. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, my view on net neutrality is there is a tremendous amount uh, of common ground on that issue. Uh, and that common ground, I think, you know, is within reach uh, in Congress uh, for them to take on such a, um, um, a significant decision as the regulatory framework, you know, for the internet, if it's going to deviate from the one that we've had almost unbroken for, for 20 years. Um, but again, I think, I think a lot of the rhetoric on net neutrality attempts to paint it um, as a partisan issue. And, and frankly, when it comes to some common sense, basic rules of the road, um, I think there's a lot of bipartisan agreement. If you want to use net neutrality as a stalking horse, say, for price regulation, uh, sure, some of the bipartisan consensus starts to, to break down there. We're talking, you know, basic common sense rules of the road. You're not talking rate regulation. You're not talking um, a lot of sort of um, utility style regulation that doesn't necessarily make sense for, for the internet. Um, and then frankly, there's a lot of bipartisan interest as well in Congress right now and looking at the full stack. I mean, if your concern ultimately is about data flows uh, and making sure there's no bias when it comes to how that data is delivered in the system, whether it is the internet, whether it is uh, email, whether it's text messaging, I think you can sort of look cloud services up and down the stack and say, you know, we think, and I think you could find this, that there's bipartisan consensus about some common sense guardrails, uh, some principles of neutrality. So at the end of the day, when it comes to net neutrality, I, I think, um, and I'm not sure if this has helped or, or hurt by EPA, but I think policymakers, particularly in Congress, can focus on that bipartisan area um, and get something done. Commissioner, uh, Gabriella Novello, Communications Daily. Um, so it seems like the initial maps are going to come out sometime this fall. Uh, as you know, NTIA yesterday announced all states have signed on for the BEAD program, and they're going to be relying on the FCC's maps to give out the funding. So how are you feeling about the progress, the way things are going? Um, do you think that NTIA should be waiting for the FCC's challenge process to be completed before they think about which map to use? How are you feeling about just how things are going at the moment? Well, for the FCC's maps, um, I'm very much full speed ahead. I mean, my, my view was I had hoped that we could get this done uh, by last fall, but it, it, it takes time. Um, I'm eager to get them done, um, not just sort of the first iteration. There, there's never going to be sort of a, a one final perfect map, but it is going to iterate. Um, the map is going to improve off of sort of the first versions that come out. And I'm all for, for moving as, as, as quickly as regulatorily possible to get those out the door because they're going to be the key to unlocking this funding. There was some concern, and I'm not quite sure how resolved it's been. Maybe it's resolved a little bit. There was initially some concern that the very, very first FCC map to come out completely unchallenged was going to be the basis for the allocation of pots of money to the states um, without the opportunity to sort of true up if a state is undercounted with their population in the very first map. But a quick challenge process tells you, you know, they got more population and therefore they should get more money from BEAT, you know, we need to be sensitive to that because, again, we've spent, what, I don't know, $100 million or something close to that for these maps for the precise reason of making sure that these funding decisions are smart, 
um, and based on accurate maps. And so I, I think I've seen some positive sounds out of NTIA about making sure that that allocation is done uh, pursuant to a, a sort of tested, accurate map, and I hope that continues to be the case, but I'm a vote for going now, getting the maps out the door, uh, and moving quickly. Lynn Stanton, TR Daily. Um, this is kind of a follow-on, in a sense, from Gabby's question. Uh, you, you've been very outspoken on um, tower climbers and workforce and uh, network security. How do you see those issues playing in with actually getting out there and spending this money and getting networks built out because there seems to be an inherent tension between those issues. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, all this bead funding has yet to hit the ground, and yet we are already seeing a pretty severe shortage of qualified tower climbers, fiber splicers, all of it. Uh, there was a report recently, I think it was in Com Daily, that a contractor that said, you know, they go to church on Sunday and they pray that the crews are going to show up on Monday. Some days they do. Some days they've been hired away by a larger business. And so I think for the larger providers, maybe this is a less of a problem because they can spend more money, they can get longer term contracts, but particularly for the, the midsize and the smaller uh, companies that are, that are building this infrastructure, we're gonna see serious workforce issues. And so that's why I've been working you know, for years now to try to stand up community college programs, other pipelines to build that up. Um, and as much as I want every dollar uh, from bead to go into the ground, I do think we need to be cognizant. Can some of that be smartly used to bolster um, these pathways in? Because again, whether it's eight to 12 weeks, you can train someone up to do this. So we are seeing a shortage right now. That shortage is gonna be exacerbated when all of these funded builds get underway, you know, roughly the same time. So this is, this is a challenge. Hey, John Hendel, Politico. I uh, just wanted to quickly ask about the future of USF proceeding and whether there's been any kind of uptick in activity around that. And, um, you know, to go back to the EPA decision too, you know, what the, you know, USF case that's out there might do in the context of these broader USF discussions. Obviously, there's a lot of debate right now about how that should be funded going forward, what that looks like, um, but also, you know, court cases about the USF itself and the delegation there. So. Yeah, I don't think I've had much meetings or lobbying recently on that USF report. Um, I've heard r rumors, not internal, I think external about it, you know, the report maybe being coming out sometime this summer. I don't know whether that's gonna be either a bureau level report, I don't know if it's going to be a voted commission level one. Um, oftentimes chairs can issue reports to Congress um, through their authority as sort of the, the CEO function of the agency. So I don't know which route the agency is ultimately gonna go on that report. My view has long been that, obviously, I, I believe that technology companies should start to contribute a fair share. There's a very small portion of that idea that I think we have the existing statutory authority to do, and probably EPA confirms that we have a very small amount of, of statutory authority to do that. I've long had the view that we need additional legislation from Congress to give us authority to fully implement what I would articulate as my vision for having uh, some set of large technology companies start to contribute. I haven't tracked that litigation that you, that you mentioned. I know, you know, I'm aware of it. Um, ultimately, obviously, depending on how it, it comes out, that could reinforce the need to have Congress take a look at more clearly addressing uh, the contribution side and who pays in. Thank you. Uh, hi, Commissioner Chris Cole, Law 360. I just would ask if NTIA has responded to any of your concerns about what you saw as politicized provisions in the funding notice that you had put out a statement shortly afterward. Have they answered any of that? I don't know that we've had a direct formal response. I have, you know, run into NTI officials in the weeks since then at, at events and, and, and had sort of uh, conversations in passing. I'm not even sure how much of those conversations in passing that I can recall it dealt exactly with this. But uh, my message is, this is an incredible opportunity, and there's so much of what NTIA did um, that's going to make a very big difference in closing the digital divide. It strikes me, however, that in terms of maximizing the bang for the buck and bringing as many Americans across the digital divide as possible, there were some policy cuts around the edges um, that are going to make that more difficult. Um, and obviously, I sort of mentioned some of those in my statement, whether it is, um, you know, largely excluding fixed wireless entirely. I, I understand the value of fiber. I 
personally, I've spliced a lot of fiber when I get out of the city. I understand why people want it, but there's a time value to fiber. And if I can get a community fiber in six or seven years, that's great. If I can get them fixed wireless, uh, slightly lower speed perhaps, um, in a matter of a weekend or a couple weeks or a month, there's a value to bringing someone across the digital divide this month versus having them wait on the wrong side for seven years. So I think as NTI looks at those state applications that are coming in, I hope they defer and give some room for people to allow fixed wireless to, to play a role. I've expressed some concerns about overbuilding. I was just in um, a small town outside of uh, Casper, Wyoming, Evansville. I think it's about 2,000 people, basically a, a, a ranching and horse community, and I was up a tower. Um, a fixed wireless provider using unlicensed spectrum is bringing 100 over 20 service to that community. And under NTIA's definition, they're gonna treat that community as if it has zero megabits over zero megabits. And that's a problem because we have many parts of the country that do in fact have zero megabits over zero megabits. So why we would overbuild someone that's invested and is bringing 120 to a rural community rather than focusing on the priority, which is the places that do in fact have zero over zero is a challenge. And then of course I have concerns on the rate regulation front. You know, they basically, it appears to be practically sort of pegging rates at a low income tier, a middle income tier, um, in, in a sort of a higher speed tier in a way that to me looks like a lot like rate regulation. They have their theory as to why it's not. But given that NTIA doesn't have authority to engage in rate regulation, um, you know, it, it, it seems questionable to me to engage in a, in a sort of Rube Goldbergian effort uh, to control rates when they've been denied the express authority to do it. Um, but again, look, I, really good things are gonna happen from this money. Americans are gonna get connected. I just think there were some, at least seeming to me, some last minute policy cuts um, that are sort of gonna be inconsistent with that goal. Tara Lynn Wimple from Broadband Breakfast Media. Um, I have a question about the, the letter that you sent to Google and Apple, and I'm wondering if you had any response or reaction from that. I did, I got a response from Google, um, I believe it might've been yesterday before I went into the hearing, so I wanna take another look at it. Um, I don't believe that I've gotten a response yet from Apple. They let me know that I had asked for a response by last Friday that they weren't gonna be able to make that. Um, that's happened before when I send letters to Apple and they ultimately send something in, so I do fully expect to get an answer from Apple as well. Um, yeah, we'll look at that letter and I'll, and I'll look at trying to make that letter available. At the end of the day, I mean, my, my hope was these companies would apply their app store policies and remove these this app TikTok from it. There's precedent from it where, as I put in my letter, Apps have hit servers in China, uh, or data has hit servers in China through apps in a way that hadn't been disclosed. The companies have taken action where there's other been surreptitious data flows, they've taken action. But to think that they're not gonna do that, um, then obviously it falls entirely on the federal government to take action here. And there's many vectors that we can do that. Uh, Treasury through the CFIUS process is engaged in a review right now. If you believe the letter that TikTok sent to the Senate, they at least leave you with the impression that they are negotiating some final agreement with CFIUS, and I don't know this to be true, I just read this from the TikTok letter, that would allow a continued amount of data back into Beijing, um, potentially a narrower set than that's taking place right now, and with new CFIUS imposed controls. Um, and again, that's concerning, because again, if you look at that BuzzFeed news story, the very last paragraph has a quote from a TikTok official saying it remains to be seen at the end of the day if product and engineering can still get access, even with those controls, because these are all tools that were built in China by China. So there's a CFIUS process that I think needs to be brought to a close with dispatch, um, with the speed that this national security concern demands, um, commerce, and now the Federal Trade Commission being asked by um, Mark Warner and Rubio. So there's at least three avenues of the federal government um, that we need to move now. I mean, look, again, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but Chairman Mark Warner, Democrat, Chair of the Senate Intel, that guy gets very high level, very serious briefings all the time. Um, and what he said recently in an interview is that it's in the context of these TikTok data flows back to China that that's what, quote, scares the dickens out of him. And if Mark Warner is scared by data flows of TikTok back into China, given everything else that that guy has, has vision to, um, this is something we have to take seriously. And it, it's, um, it's disturbing that TikTok just continues to gaslight and dodge um, when the facts are what they appear to be here. So we gotta get going as a government here. Maddie Hughes with The Well News. Um, going back to TikTok, you know, a lot of American companies, social media companies have had kind of similar data. And so how does the connections to TikTok in China, you know, 
what about that is particularly concerning to you? There's a baseline level of concern with all of these apps, no matter where they're based, that are, that are pulling up. I mean, you look at these apps have everything from um, barometric pressure devices. They know when a car door closes, when you're going in a car door, they know when you're going up an elevator. There's a real concern there. I think there's a lot of great bipartisan work going on right now um, in the House and the Senate. Um, the Republican leader, Kathy Morse rogers her, her counterpart, the chair of House Energy and Commerce, have a, have a bill that they're working on. And that could go a long ways to addressing a lot of these concerns with data flows, not just for apps that have ties back to China. The reason why I'm particularly concerned about TikTok is, is two things that are above and beyond what you see in those other apps. One has been this pattern of misrepresentations. When they're asked point blank, is this data being accessed from inside of China? When they're asked that straightforward question, they will tell you, we do not share it with the Chinese government. That's answering a question that wasn't asked where they say it is stored in the US. That's not the question that was asked, where it's stored, where can it be accessed? Or they'll say, you know, don't worry, going forward, there's gonna be new protections, which again, doesn't really ask what's been happening and also with that concern from the TikTok official about um, them continuing to be accessing it. So one, it's the pattern of misrepresentations, and then two, it's where that data has been going, which is China. And as I've said in many other contexts, we deal a lot with data flows in China at the FCC, Huawei, ZTE, China Mobile, China Unicom, so I'm very experienced. And looking at it, they got a, a track record longer than a, a CBS receipt of business industrial espionage, blackmail, um, all sorts of nefarious actions. And this is not my view. This has nothing to do with me. FBI Director Ray stood next to his MI5 counterpart just last week and said that China presents the greatest long-term threat to our national security. And he said they will use every tool at their disposal. Well, one of those tools, <laughs> if that's right, is going to be the data flows that they're getting back from TikTok. So. So that's why I think it's, it's a particular problem, but I'm also concerned generally about making sure we have a, a baseline level of privacy here. Hey, Commissioner. David DeMalfetta with S&P Market Intelligence. Thanks for holding this. Um, just another question on TikTok. You've mentioned that there's at least three avenues of government that are looking into this. Uh, your remarks at the top, you said that there have been many attempts to address this. There have been letters written. I'm wondering what can the commission do or what can your office do? And if you can't do anything, do you feel that you're stifled by the FCC's ability to levy any enforcement against TikTok? Uh, what can be done on the ground here within the FCC to, uh, in your eyes, make America safer from TikTok? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot that I can do. I don't envision this being an issue where the FCC is gonna be the lead agency. Uh, I'm happy to have um, the Senator Warner letter to the FTC asking them to launch an investigation. No problem with them uh, taking the lead, whether it's them, whether it's Commerce, um, whether it's CFIUS at Treasury. Again, my view here is I've got some expertise from examining data flows in the context of areas where we do have direct licensing and regulatory authority, um, and I'm bringing that to bear in a public way in, in the form of this letter. And again, in the last couple of weeks since then, um, either whether you're tied to my letter or you're tied to the BuzzFeed News reporting, we've seen that bipartisan Senate Intel letter. Um, we've seen the letters today from leaders in House Commerce and House Oversight. Um, in its longstanding, again, Chairman Lynch, the Democrat chair of the National Security Subcommittee of Oversight, put a letter in 2019 raising some of these very same issues about uh, TikTok's ties uh, back into China in a letter to, to Google and Apple, again, similar to what I ended up doing recently. So I'm happy to be um, a small part or frankly no part of this broader federal look at TikTok's national security concerns. Um, yeah. Hi, Commissioner. Sanya Rao here with CTFN. Um, adding to the earlier questions on TikTok, how could or does Team Telecom fit in here? Could they play a role? You know, it's, it's, it's possible. Again, my, my focus up to now has been that ongoing CFIUS review at uh, Treasury, the Commerce Department rulemaking, maybe the FTC now, uh, and potentially bipartisan interest in Congress. Um, I, I think at least it strikes me that um, that's a sufficient number of federal actors looking at it, and now we got to move with, with dispatch to a resolution. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. I have one last one. Yeah. I was just wondering if you had any reaction to Symington's, uh, Commissioner Symington's uh, Nielsen speech today. Like, do you think the commission should investigate <laughs> it's alternatives it's, to it's, Nielsen? It's called the Nielsen speech now. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to take a look at this. You know, look, I mean, uh, um, we have various issues where we have, you know, issues, various instances where we have codified particular companies 
um, products in our rules. And I think it's, you know, totally fair game to ask a, a broad set of questions about, you know, does that make sense? Did it make sense? Should it continue to make sense? And uh, I'm certainly opening to, uh, you know, continuing to, to, to listen and hear uh, where Commissioner Simonton is leading on this. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks all. Appreciate it.